take up my traditional position at the anvil. So today I have to make a pair of chest handles, folding chest handles. I make a couple of different styles of these, which I sell. And um, <clears throat> the one that's my favorite is probably this one. This, um, this style of back plate was fairly common in the 1700s and early 1800s. And um, this is the pattern for the bale, the actual handle itself. This type of folding handle, when you lift the handle to lift the chest, these stops limit the travel of the handle so that it'll stop about right here and you won't pinch your knuckles, pinch your fingers against the chest. So you can lift a very heavy chest with this. Um, 16 gauge steel, 1 16th of an inch thick is plenty thick for a back plate, but I have 14 gauge to work with today, so that's a little thicker, uh, but that'll be just fine. Um, this is a scrap of metal I had laying around, uh, quarter by three quarter, that I'll use to make the lugs that will tenon into the back plate and um, hold the bale. This piece of 3 8 square is going to be the bale itself. And uh, these are just patterns I've kept these back as patterns for each style of plate. So there's a standard um, rectangle, a lot of people like that. This, this little heart shape, hearts were a common motif in um, 1700s early America, especially amongst the Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, so anyway, this, this heart shape was, was copied from an original um, in a book that I have. Um, I took the liberty of rearranging the um, attachment holes and the spacing of the, of the lugs a little bit, but the shape itself is a direct copy. So the first step we're going to have to take, um, this is the style I'm making today actually, the heart shape. So the first step is going to be to chisel the shape that we need um, out in the, in the sheet iron. So I'm going to use both of these little cold chisels. One has a wider edge and one has a narrower edge. Um, actually, I might just use this one. The narrower chisel with a fairly pronounced curve to the edge will be nicer for, um, for following the curves. So I like a wider chisel for straighter objects and a narrower chisel for tighter curves. So I'm going to line this up on the plate. We're going to have a significant amount of waste here, but oh well. So I'm just going to scratch using a sharp marking awl. Scratch a line. You could also do this with a grease pencil or something. It doesn't have to be a super fine line because I'm not worried about precision, but a scratched line as long as you can see it will be pretty precise. So <clears throat> these attachment holes for screws need to be um, punched from one side of the plate and yet the lug, the holes for the lugs, the tenons for the lugs, um, need to be punched from the other side of the plate. And I'll explain why later. But I'm going to go ahead and lay out the attachment holes because they're going to be they're going to be punched from this side of the plate. I'm making this side of the plate that's up the face of the plate. And one of the reasons for that is as I cut with the cold chisel, it will create a natural, there we are, all five holes. It'll create a natural bevel, start a natural bevel around the edge, which I'll then just clean up into the finished bevel with files. Alright, back to the chiseling. Some people tell you you should never do this on your anvil because you don't want to cut into the anvil face. And they're not wrong, but once you have the hang of it, you can do this on, you can do this with a soft plate, a piece of piece of um, thicker plate steel just laid on the anvil. Alan, you need to have glasses on if you're gonna be 
watching, okay? Um, you can do this with a thicker plate of steel sitting on the anvil face to protect the anvil face. But once you've got some practice, it's not at all difficult to do this without cutting all the way through the sheet. So once you kind of get rolling with this cutting procedure, you basically just want to kind of walk the chisel in the groove, keeping one end of the chisel in the groove that you've already cut and walking the front end forwards. And um, to clean up a curve, you can kind of go back over it with another pass, and that'll help a little bit. that only took a couple of minutes I'd say probably two minutes two and a half minutes two or three not too long at all so one thing I am going to do is sometimes when you have a, a curve like this then you need to cut reliefs relief cuts um, probably not really necessary in this case but I'm gonna do it anyway no I don't think I will I think I can break each of these three pieces off, three major pieces, pretty easy. So what we're going to do is we've cut this most of the way through, half to two-thirds of the thickness is about what you want to get. And then we're going to take it to the vise and just break off what's left. So we're just going to pinch it in the vise, basically as close to the line as we can get it, fairly close. And then just wiggle it back and forth a little bit at a time and there we are well actually I didn't get the little nubbin off the end there we go and that will just take a little bit of file work to clean up we'll go ahead and do that now so that I don't have to deal with burrs while I'm handling it from here on. So I'm going to go ahead and clamp it in like this. So now I'm going to grab my trusty 14 inch bastard cut half round file. Literally just give this a skim. So I'm going to skim the edge first then I'll go back for the bevel. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? And there's that. So now we just need to punch the holes in this, and this will be pretty much done. Although I'll, I'll probably um, clean up the surface a little bit. I might even hot heat this up and brush the surface just because it's rusty. I wouldn't even bother if it wasn't rusty. And if I do that, then I'll have to brighten the bevel again because I like the, I like that bright bevel. That'll contrast nicely with the. The darker color of the rest of the metal. So punching from the side of the plate that's going to be the face using a fairly loose fitting bolster results in what I call a rag around the hole. And hammering that rag back in to the hole gives you 
a natural countersink to the hole. It's not a lot, but it's more than enough to securely hold the head of a countersunk screw. And these will be just perfect for number six or maybe number seven um, countersunk, traditional countersunk screw, straight slot screw. And I may go ahead and clean the holes up with a countersink bit um, just to make sure that the fit is perfect, but it won't take much cleanup at all. So now that I've punched these holes from the face, I'm going to flip this over, use my pattern to transfer the, to mark out the locations for the tenons for the, um, I call them lugs. Oh, I missed. I got it. All right, now let's see if I can find the punch I need. I'm going to use this bolster with these rectangular holes in it. My punch is here somewhere. That's not it. That's a drift. Here it is right here. It was right in front of my face. Let's see, how does that compare? It is bigger, okay. So, now you don't necessarily have to have a rectangular punch, I mean, sorry, a rectangular bolster for most rectangular punches. You can actually just use the jaws of the vise, but I'm going to opt for this. This will be less likelihood of damaging the jaws of my vise. And these I punched from the back side of the plate intentionally so that I would get that slight countersink effect on the back side and um, that will just help the tenons lock in that much better when I peen them over. Now I'll refer to that later when we rivet the tenons in place. Let's see if I can get this plate clean. I really don't want to have to heat the plate to clean it. got some gummy oil and rust on it. Maybe I can, maybe I'll lightly sand it a little bit. Not my typical treatment, but as I said, I'd like to avoid having to heat it. Just gonna go at it lightly. I don't want to shine it. I don't want to. I don't want to take the brown patina off. All right, now let's try a Scotch Brite pad. If I can figure out what I did with it, here it is. I like that pretty good. All right, that plate is 100% ready for us to go get the other parts made and get them installed. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make the bales. They're seven inches, so three and a half. Is right here. This is not absolutely necessary, but because it's been a while since I did these, I want to record center and we'll see why. So these are seven inches long. The finished length needs to be ten and a half. So I do have that recorded. So now we have to taper the bar out. We have to, we have to taper and round it and then bend the bale to the finished shape. P for pattern. 
we won't do that on these. So hopefully this is the right amount of material. I feel like it should be, may even be too much. Um, but the center will, will tell us um, whether we've got both legs the same length. I'll use a piece of soapstone. I'm gonna go ahead and make a mark. So what did I say? We need to stretch from three and a half, half we, need, we need to go to five and a quarter from the center mark. So I'm gonna measure from the heel of the anvil right here, and I'm going to make a mark at five and a quarter inches, which is right about there. And that'll give me a very quick reference mark. I'll be able to hold the piece on the anvil. I won't have to fool with the ruler or anything. And I'll be able to hold the piece on the anvil and check its length. All right, so the other first one's hot. Let's stick the second one in. And get the end of the first one a little hotter. Then we're gonna go for it. I guess I need my hammer. very end I'm going to take down to just under a quarter inch square because when I octagonalize it it will make it grow in diameter just a little bit okay so basically I forged the end down to the size I wanted all right so we're getting close we're within a quarter inch of our length already and if I hadn't wasted my heat, I'd have enough heat to go ahead and octagonalize it. All right, second one is hot. Same thing. Draw the end out about an inch and a quarter of it, maybe, down to just under a quarter inch. And then we're gonna draw a taper out between. And, don't know what, there it is. If you want to make something round, the way to do it is to forge an even octagon first. An octagon with as close to eight even sides as you can get it. And then round it up from there. This really needs a little more heat, but. Let's see, look at that. We are almost dead on the money. Hopefully we won't gain too much length when we clean it up. Some of y'all may have noticed this is not quite an even taper. I've tried to get about an inch plus on the end here is basically a quarter inch in diameter and then the taper starts at an inch plus back the taper towards the midsection so forging should be done at a high heat generally but planishing this just light smoothing can and often should be done at a low heat all right let's check our length on this one dead on the money love it all right we'll flip that one around that's quite hot enough i feel like with some practice i ought to be able to do these bales do this taper on both ends, rounding and all, in just two heats, one heat for each side, but obviously not there yet. I need some better tongs for the job too. All right, so a little bit of a simple jig. This does two things. It sets the depth of this part, just like that. Ooh, that was a little, a little bit harsh. It's okay. It 
And I'm going to go ahead and start bending this. use our pattern here. Looks like that's a little bit long. So the trick here is to get the necessary shaping and forging done without um, really like dinging the surface. Unlike some of my customers, I don't like dings. Honest, clean forging hammer texture is fine with me, but I don't care for exaggerated hammer texture. in the vise and there's our basic handle now comes the final tweaking where and it fits in there a tight tight fit which is exactly what I want it's what I've determined I need from previous experiments but now what I want to do is a final step is I want to adjust, and this could be done cold, but I want to adjust the angle, the upward angle of those stops. I don't want them at a 90, I want them slightly inclined. So this bale came out perfectly acceptable, but it's a bit big compared to the pattern. It'll be perfectly fine for this um, pair of handles. So what I have realized is from my pattern is that my notes were off. And so while this bow has, this handle has a really great shape, it's a little bit bigger than the pattern, obviously. So um, I think it'll be fine for this pair of handles, but on future ones, I will go ahead and shorten the overall length by at least a half an inch. I think a half inch should do it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead while these are still warm and cool them, dip them in some linseed oil for just sort of a little bit of a protective finish. Not something I do on everything. Yes, Travis? Uh, we found a big stigma. A big stigma? Yeah. I don't remember what a stigma is, the creature anyway. It's part of a flower. Is it? Yes. What kind of flower is it from? It's, I don't remember what it's called again. You remember the name of the, the body part of the flower, but not the flower itself? All right. There's one, get the other. And yes, this is an old diaper. I mean, you have six going on seven little kids running around. Tends to be a lot of those around. All right, so our bales are done. I think they look pretty nice if I do say so myself. So for the lugs, we have quarter by three quarter flat bar. I'm gonna get it hot, we're gonna make a hole in the end.
Okay, so that fits there. Doesn't quite fit that one, but a little file work and it would. All right, now we need to cut this off. And I want about a quarter of an inch plus maybe a little bit. Yep, that'll work. And there are our four lugs. So I'm just going to file the outside just a little bit. This is not so much for looks as it is to prepare it for the, one of the next steps. File a quick chamfer. So there's that. Ah. Ah. It's not a project unless it's thrown in the dirt a few times. Okay, so now I need to establish a baseline for my tenon. So I'm just using the punch that I used to punch the rectangular holes on the plate as a layout aid. Okay, so this line basically establishes where the lug will meet the plate. So that's about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Now I'm going to line that up, that line, with the jaws of the vise, clamp it shut, file this down to length. If there was a lot of meat there, I would just go ahead and saw it, but there's not. So now I'm going to use the punch, since it's about the same size as the hole in the plate. It's a little bit smaller because of that rag we hammered back in. But that gives me a line to cut the tenon to. And I'm going to cut, I'm going to basically straddle the line with the saw. So the kerf will cut centered on the line. That'll give me a little bit of slop in the hole in the plate. So I'm going to cut down, trying not to cut into the vice jaws. So there's that. Now we will just clean that up a little bit of a file. And then I'm going to narrow the tenon just a little. And at this point, you could go ahead and just take your back plate and make sure the tenon fits through. That's just perfect. Uh, for a tenon that fits pretty well, a sixteenth of an inch sticking through is more than enough. So now comes the moment of truth. It's time for final assembly. So we're going to take all our parts back over to the anvil. And I'm going to see if I have a swage, round bottom swage, that will support these. So this is a three quarter round bottom swage that supports that shape pretty well. If I was to do this riveting without that, there'd be a risk of collapsing the hole a little bit if I did it on a flat surface. And collapse the hole I do not want to do. All right, now we're gonna support that. We're gonna start in the center of the tenon. You do not want a heavy hammer for riveting work. A heavy hammer would actually deform the metal worse. It's it's hard to describe the physics because I'm not a not a scientist, but the heavier the hammer, the more the the force goes through the piece more. A lighter hammer, the force is actually absorbed right there in the tenon that you're working on and it, it actually rivets better, spreads the metal on the end better without um, unnecessary force going down deep. All right. So there's one locked in there quite nicely. A little bit of a burr raised there. I'll take that off. All right. 
Now we'll go ahead with the next plate and we'll install one in it. Don't make the mistake that almost all of us have made of accidentally installing both lugs and forgetting that the, uh, the bale has to be installed at the same time as the second lug. Okay, so now we have to install the bale. And if we can't get this, oh, there it went. Sometimes you have to do a little file work on those. All right, there's one. Sometimes when you get to this stage, these don't both hit the plate at once. And that's not necessarily a problem, but it's something that um, if that's the case, you can go ahead and tweak tweak one or the other in the vice cold um, until they both hit the plate with equal pressure, which is better. So this is just a little countersink swage to make sure that these holes are ready for their screws. Heck of a lot quicker than cutting it since it's so close. There's no reason not to use the suede. All right, now, last step is just to make sure these things are gonna sit nice and flat. All done, just need screws.